eight Fire Emblem characters in Smash Ultimate? I really don't mind. It's whatever. Four Fire Emblem characters in Codename Steam? Uh... <laughs> Frick. My voice cracked there and I tried to save it. I'm not going to do another take though. Screw that. Nintendo is fantastic when it comes to developing and publishing video games. They've got a high quality track record, but their output is typically very, let's say, samey. Mostly Zelda Bros and The Legend of Mario. You know the ones. The second party developers, however, aside from mostly being required to cycle through the same two or three smaller IPs, generally put out some of the most creative and underrated series under Nintendo's belt. One such second party developer is Intelligent Systems. Though you probably mostly know them for Fire Emblem, WarioWare, and Paper Mario, they're also the team behind The War series, Puzzle League, Pushmo, Battle Clash, Card Hero, Cubivore. We get it. You can read the Wikipedia page for games developed by Intelligent Systems. Could you get on topic already? Today we're talking about Codename Steam. Released for the Nintendo 3DS in 2015, Codename Steam is a unique turn-based strategy game set in a comic book-style post-American Civil War alien invasion. The player takes control of prominent American literary and folklore figures who form the secret military unit dubbed the Strike Team Eliminating the Alien Menace, or Steam for short. Cute. Led by a presumed dead Abraham Lincoln, the agents use steam-powered weaponry to fight foes in an up-close and free-to-move 3D space seldom seen in most turn-based strategy games. I've always thought this game looked interesting, but I've been afraid to take the plunge in past, based on my general indifference toward the strategy game genre. But seeing as how the 3DS had recently retired and I found the game at GameStop for $4.99, I decided to play it on my newly purchased 2DS. And let me tell you, this game is way worth it at that price. If I had a 3DS and the chance to play a demo or something back when it first released, I probably would have thought it was worth the initial 40. The range of motion on maps and third-person perspective make for a surprisingly engaging gameplay experience. I'd often find myself standing on the very edge of tiles in order to make full use of the steam each character has available. Plus, the limited amount of checkpoints and cost of restoring health and steam incentivized me to play as smartly as possible. And having a maximum of four characters per map encourages experimentation in such a way that you can play both defensively and offensively. I initially felt that there wasn't enough diversity in the enemy designs, but despite their mostly uniform colors, I quickly began to recognize the types of enemies I was encountering and anticipating what moves they might make as a result. It also helps that the further you get into the game, the more diverse they become in body type. The healers look like elephants. At time of writing this, I haven't fiddled around with the multiplayer just yet. But to be fair, if no one's playing Sushi Striker online over 3DS or Switch, I'm gonna assume that no one's playing this game either. So purely as a game, I quite enjoy Codename Steam. It definitely has room for improvement, but we'll get to that later. Right now, I want to talk a little bit about the game's world. Now I consider myself well-read, or at the very least a fan of classic literature. In fact, I'd read most of the books that this game's characters come from during my time from 6th to 12th grade. The fact that the cast and setting of this game are mostly to be found in 19th century literature is by and large the biggest aspect of this game that intrigued me the most. It's a concept that can either be done really well, or very poorly. If you take a glance at stories with similar premises, like Once Upon a Time, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, or Grim Avengers, you might be forgiven for thinking the public domain character crossover idea isn't really worth your time. Not to mention, Steampunk hasn't had a great track record either. I can happily say, however, that this game does its premise justice. All its concepts are satisfyingly explored, and the direction and voice performances are well above acceptable with the exception of Will Wheaton as President Lincoln, whose plantation owner Colonel Sanders accent mixed with his uncharacteristically high timber read as inauthentic at best and demeaning at worst. Correct. They aim to revive the Shuggoth and reclaim our planet in their name. I'm sure it helps that the game's story is fairly simple, but it's not without a fair amount of character development, interactions, world building, and mumbo jumbo. I don't know for sure where the sentiment comes from or who it's attributed to, if anyone, but I've heard it said before from a relation of mine in the film industry that all good grounded stories with fantastical settings stick to one singular instance of mumbo jumbo. It refers to a fantastical element or proponent that doesn't exist in reality, but does in the story being told. So if you have an urban fantasy setting where the world is realistic, the audience will only suspend their disbelief for one instance of mumbo-jumbo. 
such as the existence of vampires, or life on other planets, or a time machine. You get the idea. An example of mumbo jumbo being used to an excess would be ABC's Once Upon a Time. The show piles on mumbo jumbo in the form of magic, rules the magic operates under, additional rules and forms of magic that contradict other magic and the rules that they operate under. Thankfully, Codename Steam limits its mumbo jumbo significantly. It operates under the fantastical instance that the world's government secretly developed high-tech steam-powered weapons, and fictitious characters and elements related to them exist. The game doesn't add anything that needs further justification within the world's already established mumbo jumbo. The game makes it clear, for instance, that magic does not exist. All supernatural or fantastical elements consistently adhere to the world's logic. I'm gonna get into it a little bit, so consider this a spoiler warning. Most of the game takes place in real-world locations, but the only fictional territory visited is the Land of Oz from Frank Brom's classic books. In cheeky reference to the world's steampunk premise, the Land of Oz does not have any magic, but rather makes use of a strange, foreign, and seemingly magical energy known as electricity. Brilliant. Never Never Land is also implied to exist, but only in Milton's journal entry for Tiger Lily whereby he notes that he can't pin down what Native American tribe she belongs to, and that she seems to be far more mature than her age would suggest. Again, it's cheeky. I love it. Oh, by the way, Milton over here is John Milton Hay, author of Paradise Lost and a biography of Abraham Lincoln. He's an NPC that serves as Lincoln's secretary and chronicles everything that happens in the game. Again, brilliant. He's not the only one who chronicles things, though. The enemies in the game are logged by a playable character that you meet halfway through the game called Randolph Carter, the protagonist of many stories out of H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. And yes, the alien invaders are the monsters from those books. Carter describes the invaders, the Necronomicon, and other Lovecraftian elements as belonging to dark science, and that he himself might mistakenly be referred to as an expert of the quote-unquote occult. So again, magic is nowhere to be found in this world. And the only mumbo jumbo present is the existence of these many fictional characters and elements, and the historically inaccurate development of steam-powered weaponry. In summary, Codename Steam is a delightfully unique experience from almost every angle. What it does right, it does really right. And what it does wrong? We'll get to that, Pingy. The series is called What It Is, Why It's Missing, and How to Do a New. I've established what it is, so now, let's get into why it's missing. What's there to get into? The game came out five years ago, and it even has a spirit and some music in Smash Ultimate. Not to mention Intelligent Systems has been working on the last two Paper Marios, the last three Fire Emblems, and WarioWare Gold. It ain't exactly missing in action. I guess you're right. I just have a bad feeling about its future, or potentially, lack thereof. As Fingy aptly pointed out, Intelligent System has spent the last five years since Codename Steam's release working on more Paper Mario, Fire Emblem, and WarioWare games. The Switch recently got the latest installments of Paper Mario and Fire Emblem, so I think it's safe to assume that WarioWare is coming sometime soon. 2022, if my Year of Wario idea actually comes to fruition. And a new Pushmo or similar eShop title also seems likely based on the past release schedules. So why do I get the feeling that they won't revisit the Codename Steam IP? Two words, poor reception. In its first week on sale in Japan, the game sold fewer than 1,900 copies at retail. That's a pitiful first week for a Nintendo published title, especially on the highly popular 3DS, which was topping Japan's console sales charts consistently at the time. According to VG Charts, the game's global lifetime sales are somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.22 million, or 220,000 copies. In terms of poison mushroom deaths in the United States, that might be considered a large amount. But in terms of lifetime video game sales, especially by Nintendo's metric, it's abysmally low. Not to mention the game received mixed reviews by many journalists and review outlets. The game was generally criticized for being too slow paced, especially at launch before the option to fast forward enemy turns was patched in. In essence, Intelligent Systems intended to alter their winning Fire Emblem slash Advance War strategy formula to be more appealing and accessible for players like me who weren't really interested in that genre. But they didn't anticipate, however, that those uninterested players simply wouldn't care, and that seasoned strategy enthusiasts would be off-put by the changes. Overall, I don't think Nintendo will give a second chance to what might straight up be considered a bomb. And if anything, Intelligent Systems will either try a totally new IP, 
or revisit Advanced Slash Battalion Wars before they even consider doing another codename Steam. But just because they probably won't doesn't mean I can't detail how I'd potentially want a sequel to play out if they do. So let's move on to the how to do a new part of this video and go over what I would improve, carry over, or do differently for a sequel to Codename Steam. In terms of gameplay, I wouldn't change too much. I know it was probably the most polarizing aspect of the first game, but I think it'll only take a couple quality of life improvements to make the overall experience more digestible. First off, there ought to be an ability to toggle the speed of enemy turns. I spent my entire playthrough of the first game with a fast forward option on, but it operates on one set speed. And I must admit, there were times where I wish it was just a little bit faster. The main problem is that it accounts for all the enemies moving, even the ones you can't see or are super far away from any of your troops. I still think it's important to watch enemy turns play out, elsewise you could lose track of enemies and damage troops alike, and wouldn't be able to plan ahead for your next turn. So perhaps if you could use a slider or sequence of button presses to alter the speed of enemy turns based on how you want to watch it, that could serve as a good compromise. Another new element I'd introduce that straight up wasn't in the first game is a map. Something you can pull up on the pause menu or with a dedicated button to survey the whole level. Maybe even including a mini-map would help, considering that a future title would likely no longer be handheld exclusive and have more room on screen for such things. The map could even work similarly to Hyrule Warriors' map, whereby enemies, allies, and other important elements are color-coded or have distinct icons. One last gameplay tweak I'd introduce is more leniency with checkpoints. The original game had checkpoints where you can save your progress once and even heal one or all of your troops if you have enough coins. I praised this feature at the start of this video, but I will admit, it'd be nice if there was an option to resume from any save as opposed to just the latest one if you die. I know consequence is important in games, and players' actions should be made in hope of advancement and fear of losing progress. But honestly, if the save before your last save is a better place to restart because you messed up with your latest save, but the save before that is too far into the map, thus making a full restart from the beginning more inconvenient, maybe it would be better for the game's image and player's time to just include an option to resume from any save. Maybe make it cost 10 coins or something if you still want to keep an element of consequence to using it. What's more, checkpoints in the past give you an option to either heal the agent standing in front of it, or the entire party. There were many points during my playthrough where I had an agent in front of the checkpoint who had all their health and steam, while another one of my agents on the opposite side of the map was on the very verge of death, while my other two units were also on full health and steam. Including an option to choose which agent out of all of your agents gets the one-time heal option would be much appreciated. So that's all I do to improve the core gameplay. However, there is one other secondary gameplay aspect that needs a major rehaul. This is the Anthropomorphized Battle Engine, or Abe. Yes, very cute. Yeah, 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 yeah. On occasion, three if I remember correctly, the player will take control of Abe and the gameplay will shift to a first-person perspective with no tiles and full range of movement. Only one attack move is utilized, yeah, 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 yeah. and using this move depletes steam. Steam units are recouped once per second automatically, but Abe moves too slow to get away from enemy fire before enough steam can be recouped, and doesn't have enough health to just power through enemy attacks. These Abe sections are infrequent, but not fun. So what to do with these sequences? Nothing. Don't bring them back. If you want to give players control of a giant robot, make it control like regular characters. If you absolutely must do these sections in a first person perspective too, then adjust the robot speed to compensate. I understand wanting to break up the gameplay and keep things fresh, but the Abe segments were not fun to play and they were super short to boot, which contrasts horribly in comparison to how long regular stages take to finish anyway. Not to mention they established that Abe is a transformer who swaps between being a fighting robot and a locomotive but they do nothing with it. At no point in the game do you do anything in the train form. It just feels like a half-baked idea that, in my opinion, isn't worth putting back in the oven. Unlike F-Zero, the last series I did a video like this on, Codename Steam embraces its comic book inspiration outright. The cutscenes play out like a Silver Age comic in action. Its stylistic identity is loud, proud, and very well endowed. Well endowed. I ran out of rhymes. I wouldn't change the aesthetics even a little bit. Graphically, however, the original game looks rough, even by the 3DS's standards. The characters are very well designed, but their in-game models are choppy and look straight up bad in certain points. Luckily, 
should a sequel ever come about. It'll either be on the Switch or something even more powerful. So I'm sure more care would be put into the in-game assets. The original game had a handful of memorable NPCs, such as First Officer Catherine, the aforementioned secretary John Milton Hay, the unnamed helmsman, and other world leaders like the Queen's Victoria of England and Ozma of Oz. We'll get into story a little later, but suffice it to say, I'm going for a wider scope in terms of locations. Plus, we have that map in the fray now, so we need a cartographer, an influential figure of American literature who is famous for infinite wandering in strange places. I propose this role be filled by John Thornton, the kindest owner of the sled dog Buck in Jack London's classic novel, Call of the Wild. Similarly to how Queequeg is rescued from out of the ocean by Steam, thus justifying him not being dead as he's presumed to be at the end of Moby Dick, I propose that Steam rescue Thornton, who they find in the woods at the site where the Yee Hat seemingly killed him before fleeing after their encounter with what Steam is told is a vengeful spirit, but was really just Buck who's answered the call of the wild and disappeared into the wilderness at this point. So now we have a fun American literary deep cut providing the maps. So why not do the same for the Liberty's pilot? The original helmsman is fine, but he's just some unnamed guy. The new pilot could be Amelia Earhart, or Phileas Fogg from Around the World in 80 Days, or whoever, really. Just let the original helmsman die heroically or tragically or whatever, and have someone more interesting take his place. As for playable characters, I say keep the original 12 Steam Agents from the first game, obviously. As for new agents, I won't go over them all in great detail like I did with John Thornton earlier, but I will say that going alongside this game's wider scope, I won't limit myself to just using characters who originate in American literature. I mean, the first game technically didn't either, because they included Tiger Lily, who comes from Peter Pan, which was written in England, but I guess she gets a pass because she's technically American, but you know just an ethnicity. I will naturally, however, stick with the late 19th century time frame. Some fun new agents that would double the number of agents from the first game might include Paul Bunyan, Ned Land from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Tarzan, Lord of the Apes, Gentleman Thief Arsene Lupin, The Virginian, Long John Silver from Treasure Island, Dr. Doolittle, Anne of Green Gables, they had Tom Sawyer, why not, Sherlock Holmes, Van Helsing from Bram Stoker's Dracula, and the unnamed protagonist from H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. Whoa, 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 whoa. Time travel? Really? Well, yeah, I just thought it might be neat. No, 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 no. Introducing time travel is a can of worms just waiting to spill, my friend. Don't jump off the deep end. Stick with one mumbo jumbo. Yeah, you're right. Okay, fine. No time machine representation. Let's instead round it out with... Hmm, say a descendant or relation to John Carter of Mars. Similarly to how the fox in the first game is a relation of Zorro. Both Zorro and Burroughs' Mars series are technically public domain, but Disney and Warner Brothers have weird trademark stipulations that they somehow got away with. Copyright laws may be messy, but nothing's more messy than time travel. That's only a sample amount of characters I could come up with. And of course there's any number of characters they could potentially introduce. Either way, Thinking of new characters was just too much fun not to touch upon, at least briefly, in this video. You know, not all the playable characters in Codename Steam were from old books and folk songs. In fact, a quarter of them came from amiibos. Oh, yeah. I guess I should address the elephant in the room. Not you! Codename Steam was released in 2015. A weird and unusual time for Nintendo, where very few games were coming out, and the ones that did tried and failed to make good use of Nintendo's newly introduced amiibo figures. There's no story reason as to why they're here, and they're not even redesigned with steampunk theming. The only case you could make for them being here is the fact that the game starts with a POV of a kid reading the events of the game as a comic book with a Marth amiibo on his desk. But I feel like that scene was only included to make this loose connection. Other than that, the scene serves absolutely no purpose at all. There's no justification for the Fire Emblem character's inclusion. It's stupid, and I hate it. I really do. And this was just two years after Fire Emblem Awakening came out, and the same year as Fire Emblem Fates. Clearly Intelligent Systems, and probably the same Nintendo higher-ups who made Sakurai include Corrin in Smash 4's DLC, were just trying too hard to make Fire Emblem feel prominent. If I recall correctly, Nintendo were threatening to pull the plug on the Fire Emblem franchise if the 3DS game's sales didn't meet expectations at the time. So I guess that's what's inspired all this overcompensation. 
Well, mission accomplished, apparently. Fire Emblem is definitely in the top 20 selling franchises now, so can we keep it out of my post-Civil War sci-fi games, please? If you want to have amiibos unlock costumes or power-ups or something, fine. But don't straight up include them as characters in the game. They're so out of place, it hurts. <laughs> At the end of the first game, Lincoln seemingly sacrifices his life to destroy the Shugath and save the Earth. However, at the end of the credits, we see his signature stovetop hat sitting next to an emerald key. An Aussian device with teleportation powers similar to Dorothy Gale's silver slippers. Look, they were silver in the book. MGM made them ruby because they were super stoked about color. This implies that Lincoln is alive. But where did he go? The question has a nigh limitless amount of possible answers. And whichever answer ends up being decided on should naturally be the catalyst for the events of the sequel. Right? Maybe. But I'm actually gonna say no. If it were up to me, I wouldn't take the obvious route. I'd still honor the tease and follow through with Lincoln's return, of course. But I want it to be mainly outside of Steam's priorities. They think he's dead, after all. Now, the events of the first game take place during a loosely defined point in history after Lincoln's assassination in 1865, but before Queen Victoria's death in 1901. Despite also using characters and books published many decades before and after both these events, but I digress. Those books don't exist in this universe. Remember the mumbo jumbo. Any whom how, the team is only a couple decades away at most from the start of World War I. I feel that while this setting is viable, could be interesting, and justify widening the game's geographical scope, the tragic global conflict might be a little too heavy for a Nintendo game, but that's just me. One of the aspects I enjoy about the first Codename Steam is how tastefully it handled the character's relation to its setting. The conflict of the Civil War was never addressed, and the threat of the alien menace remains the focus of the game throughout. With all that being said, I think a dynamic that the first game lacked was a compelling villain. The alien menace was... well, menacing, sure. But there's no straight-up maniacal comic book villain to complement the game's tone and contrast with the stoic comic book heroes. So who would make a good villain for a sequel? I say, why settle for one, when you could have several? Here's my pitch, bear with me. An old royal has used dark science to find a way to alter himself so that he may keep himself alive for centuries. He stays in a secluded location where he spends those centuries accumulating power so that he may one day emerge and take over the Earth. His plan was initially to let the Lovecraftian monsters return and reawaken the Shugath, that way, he need only worry about conquering them with his dark army, thus making his quest for world domination much easier than he could have anticipated without having to worry about human interference. Unfortunately for this scheming foe, Lincoln and his steam agents destroyed the Shugath and saved the planet, thus ruining his plan. Frustrated with this turn of events, the villain decides that with the world in a state of disarray, now is the time to reach out to his allies in darkness and form a coalition capable of destroying Steam, and then the world! This villain is none other than Count Vlad Dracula. I know, I know, he's kind of overused, but I think he fills the role too perfectly. Plus, he might also make use of his propensity for hypnotism and raising the dead to make some equally powerful and compelling cohorts such as the Wicked Witch of the West, who'd presumably be dead at this point considering the events of the Wizard of Oz have already taken place, but perhaps Drac would take her melted remains and put them into a mech or something fun. Or Mr. Edward Hyde, who was perhaps once the respected steam agent Henry Jekyll, but was seduced by the power of dark science. And perhaps Dracula might also hire slash take over more fun and diverse hordes of enemies for steam to fight level to level. Like a band of pirates, from Treasure Island or Peter Pan or something similar. Strange and horrific beasts from the works of authors like Edgar Rice Burroughs, H.G. Wells, Lewis Carroll, or whoever. What about Lincoln? You said that you'd still honor the Lincoln tees, right? That's the beauty of it, Fingy. With Lincoln not being around and Henry Fleming being Steam's current leader, that'd play into the game's story interactions. The character interactions in the first game were cute, but for the most part, everybody gets along perfectly. No tension, no conflict, no turmoil. This time around, on top of back and forth between villains, I want constant nagging questions to weigh on each agent's mind throughout the course of the entire game. Can Steam continue without Lincoln? Is Henry Fleming fit to be our leader? What do we do now? Like I said earlier, don't outright include World War I, 
maybe insinuate that the world's powers are on the verge of it and don't want to accept Steam's aid and keep them out of those affairs. Perhaps this neglect pushes Steam to become something of a nonpartisan group. With no wars to fight, no lives to save, tragically and ironically enough, right before the world would go to war with itself after they had saved it in the last game. Thusly, the threat of Dracula and his coalition of darkness dead set on destroying them would lend the game this overarching feeling that the agents are fighting for their right to exist. It's basically a meta-commentary on the state of the franchise as a whole. The new villains would individually kidnap agents and take them to different corners of the world, thus justify you starting from ground zero and introducing agents one by one, as was the case with the first game. You'd start out with Henry Fleming and the non-playable crew of Lady Liberty, and over the course of the game you'd rescue all your fellow agents, who vary in perspective and attitude on the dire situation they're in. Throughout the whole journey, they'd reminisce over the strangely fond memories they have for the events of the first game, and mourn the loss of Lincoln, thus making it all the more satisfying when Lincoln returns, preferably in some sort of a twist, like he's secretly a reoccurring masked character or he's leaving hints everywhere, or, you know, something like that. I've been talking a lot about a strangely ambitious and probably a little cringy pitch for a sequel to a game that flopped hard from a company that's mostly mandated to work on particular Nintendo franchises. <gasps> but at the end of the day, even if Codename Steam is destined to be a one-hit wonder, its scope, premise, imagination, and space for creative exploration is something I will personally always appreciate. I'd love a sequel of any kind, even if it improves very little on the first game and keeps the stupid Fire Emblem characters. But what about you? Did you play Codename Steam? If you didn't, would you check it out with a remake or a sequel on the Switch? Do you feel compelled to try it on 3DS after hearing me gush about it for however many minutes? Let me know in the comments below. And now... Can you hear that car outside? Hopefully you can't. Anyway, patrons! I forgot to ask for likes and subscribes. Do that if you haven't. Please and thank you. If you'd like to support my endeavors, as well as receive benefits which range from getting your name at the end of the credits of my videos to being immortalized in your very own Talking Soxona, then be sure to pledge to my Patreon. I tried to do it in one take. Shoot! Pledge to my Patreon for as little as $1 a month, or as much as $10 a month. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you the next time I see you. Ah! <laughs>